A very good afternoon to everyone. And on behalf of the church pastoral team, I'd like to wish everyone here a happy Lunar New Year Eve. Yeah. So when I was assigned to preach today, I, I really scratched my head as to uh, what would be fitting for our reflections on such an occasion. So I started to become curious as to how God, how the Lord looked at the idea of New Year. And so today's sermon is based largely upon Exodus 12. I think if you open your Bibles, you might be a bit more helpful. As you can tell, I can't pluck out the whole passage. Uh, so where God instituted for the Israelites their New Year. Basically, what Exodus 12 talks about is um, the, the restart of a new year. From that month onwards, it will be the biblical new year. It will be the January. And I pray that the reflections gleaned from today's passage will help frame our minds as we enter the new year together. Let us pray. Father, indeed, Lord, um, as we enter a new year to, together as a community, Lord, may you reveal to us your truth. May the Spirit work in our hearts. And Lord, may we have open ears and hearts soft to the voice of the Spirit. Father, we commit the entire um, message into your hands. We pray all these in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So Chinese New Year is always a season of feasting and festivities. I myself just came from another reunion lunch. So there's a whole period of celebration, 15 days in total, with certain days having certain meanings and certain things to do. And there are also a lot of symbolic gestures, tasks to complete. I'm pretty sure those who are living with perhaps more superstitious elders at home or who have been brought up in that culture will have a lot of things they can and cannot do. And, and, for, and even spring cleaning, something so practical, you know, it's not just to fulfill the practical aspect of preparing for visitation, but it's also to dust away bad luck to invite the new. Well, you know, it's interesting that the way we, if you think about it, the way we celebrate our new year really reflects that core culture and values of our people group. So for the Chinese, I think much of the festivity surrounds the theme of luck, prosperity, and harmony. And so as we look at the way the Lord commands the Israelites to celebrate their new year, we can see the emphasis and values of the Lord through their celebrations. And so we'll be looking at the different emphasis that we can glean from the passage. Well, firstly, as with all New Year celebrations, there is an emphasis on a new beginning. So Exodus 12, 2 says, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. Like I said earlier, this is basically God saying, from now on, this is going to be your January, okay? So in the original text, the sentence was structured in such a way that you may even translate it as, this month, yes, this month will be for you the beginning of months. You know, it's interesting to me that the structural emphasis, right, was not on the word beginning, you know, you would have thought it would be on the word beginning, but it's on the word month. And so we got to think, what's so special about this month? Well, if you look at the context, the answer can be quite obvious. Exodus 12 is basically God's instructions given to the Israelites before the Passover happened. It was to tell them, basically, hey guys, look, um, I'm going to deliver you from the Egyptians. And so here is how we are going to celebrate it in future. This month for you will be, from now on, commemorated as the first month of your new life as a people saved. So in verse 17, it describes the whole purpose for the period of festivities. He says, For on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. So this whole entire of the new year, this new year celebration period for the Israelites was not a time to celebrate you know, the turn of a calendar new year. It was not a time to celebrate like harvest or spring, not so much. It was to celebrate a new beginning as God's people. The emphasis on a new beginning for them is all about them being birthed as God's people. That's what they mean by new beginning. That's what they mean by a new year. And it's not new because of seasons of dates or superstitions, but new because the identity of an entire group of people has emerged new. And for us in church today as Christians, I think it's quite clear the parallel. Our new beginning can be found in Christ. 
where we have been made a new creation in him, as 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. And in this verse, clearly, when we talk about new things, it's not about old things like clothes or whatever, or old luck, or welcome a new prosperity in life. It is about the old you, who you are, dead and helpless in sin, to die and become alive now in Christ. It is not something external, clothes, circumstances, activities you do, like, you know, what you do, you attend church or attend Saturday class or whatever, but something deeply internal. It's about your inner life, your worldview, your perspective, your values. I think you can see in the verse here, in the NLT version, um, the efficients even call it a new nature. You know, when I was younger, growing up in church, there was a time that got me reflecting on what it means to be in church community. How is it different from being in another social community? You know, I think I was about in my mid-20s then, uh, and I served actively in church, okay, at that point. Um, yet truthfully, right, in that period of my life, my oasis of comfort and friendship was with my, well, now, ex-colleagues, and even old school friends, and they are not all Christians. You know, and, and as I served and encountered various negative experiences, I started pondering about this whole issue about loving the church community. And one thing that I realized was that a part of my possible unhappiness is because I really don't want to, like, you know, when you're already in your 20s, I think some of y'all can really, or even older, and actually now can be even worse. <laughs> you know, you, as you grow older, you really don't want to, like, mix with people that, you know, don't vibe or, like, don't connect with, you know, me. But as a leader at that point, I, I had to, you know, and, and that was hard for me. In fact, even now as a pastor, it's still hard. <laughs> but that was when the Lord showed me the difference between His kingdom and that of the world. In a nutshell, you know, the story was very long, you know, but he told me, my conclusion at the end was, he, he told me, Sing Hui, this is my family. This is my body. And that was when I realized that as Christians in the family of God, we are not to look at one another as just another person in church, but to look upon them as my sister, my brother, someone God has loved enough to die for as well. This was very different from, you know, I try to be kind or try to be nice uh, to a person that I don't really know. But this was a calling to have cassette love, you know, a loyal love to this individual, even if everything about this person irks me. And this is why I say even though I'm a pastor today, it is still hard. Yet as new creations in Christ, we do this hard thing with the power of the Holy Spirit. It says here in Ephesians, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. We do this hard thing with the love from Christ because clearly, by our own limited strengths and sinful inclinations, we can never do it. You know, the world looks at loving your unlovable neighbor, unlovable neighbor. I think it's all easy to love your lovable neighbor, okay? So the challenge is when we have to love our unlovable neighbor. So the world looks at this as, you know, compassion and like being um, the bigger person or playing the higher morality card like hey don't go and uh, don't don't be at that person's level that's how we try to be kind and nice to people that you know we don't really like but the kingdom perspective looks at loving that sort of neighbor as simply loving someone as the lord uh, loving someone whom the lord loves and that you are also not a better sinner than him or her as well Definitely not before a holy God. So, brothers and sisters, there ought to be a fundamental difference in the way we think, live, and love if we are new creations in Christ. You know, what I've shared as an example of simply, is simply one aspect of how the kingdom of God looks at things differently from the kingdom of the world. There's so many other things, charity, justice, whatever. There's so many other things that the kingdom of God looks so differently from the world. And perhaps as we celebrate Chinese New Year this year, instead of simply going through the motions, I'd like to invite us into a time of reflection about our new beginning this year. The emphasis of newness in the spiritual calendar of God is not new for the sake of being new, but on the newness of our lives in Christ Jesus through the mighty power of the Holy Spirit, that we are no longer slaves to the flesh, but free in Christ. 
So based on this first emphasis of new beginnings, maybe two reflections for us. Uh, and don't worry about it. Uh, we won't have time to like, you know, have a 10-minute reflection time. We will, at the end of the, the whole entire thing, we might uh, pass a picture of the slides uh, around to anyone who is interested. Yeah. So two reflection points. What old worldview or perspective is God seeking to renew in your life this year? How is your life different from others who do not know God? Or is it actually very similar? Is it only a difference in externals, like the activities you participate in? Or is it a difference in the inner life? Secondly, there is an emphasis on remembrance. Verse 14 says it clearly, it is a memorial day. In other translations, it says it's a day of remembrance. We've got to ask, but remember what? Lah? So Exodus 12, verse 26 to 27 says, When your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. You know, at first, first glance, it seems that we can easily say, oh, uh, basically, it's to remember that they were saved. Lah. Yeah, and it is true, it's to remember that they were saved. But if we were to simply stop here, honestly, you could feel like God was a bit narcissistic. Ah. It feels like somebody always every year tell you, hey, remember I helped you, remember that day I helped you, remember that time I helped you, every year for hundreds of years, <laughs> you know, asking you to remember that. It's a bit forced, ah, this Thanksgiving. So is there more than God wanting them to remember that he saved them through the Passover and asking them to give thanks. What is it exactly that God wants to call into remembrance here? Well, firstly, maybe we can find some clues in the way we look at our traditions. Often during our Chinese New Year traditions, we have many taboos, right, like I mentioned. Um, and so for us, as Chinese, as I mentioned, you can see how much of it has to do with luck, prosperity, and harmony. For the Israelites, there are also traditions, symbols, etc. that are associated with the Passover festival. And what these symbols mean would help us to understand just what is called to remembrance here. What on earth are they supposed to remember? So I'll play a video here. It's a video excerpt from a rabbi who shares a little bit about how the Jews today, at least, celebrate their Passover festival. Okay. So what is Passover? Passover is the Jewish holiday of liberation based on our own story of emergence from Egypt and our becoming free. It's the most important holiday on the Jewish calendar. Pesach is where our history began, where we went from being a clan, a small family, to being a nation. It's the birth of, of what it means to be Jewish in the world today. So Passover happens during the Hebrew month of Nisan, uh, which is, historically speaking, the first month of the biblical calendar. It usually happens around March or April, sometimes May. Passover in the state of Israel is observed for seven days and outside of Israel for eight days. And during those days, the way that Jews eat changes very significantly. We do not have leaven, which for most of the Jewish community means having matzah. It's a different kind of bread, which reminds us of the race that we were in when we left Egypt. We left in such a hurry, we didn't have time to let the bread rise. Leaven is what happens when bread rises. We actually come to understand that as a metaphor. On Passover, I'm called to take the parts of me that are puffed up, the parts of me that just rise much bigger than they should, and to say, you know what, actually right now, let me remember humility, let me remember the worth of everyone else, and not think so much of myself. On Passover, we have a Seder, some of us have two. Seder is a word that literally means order. And in this very elaborate ritual uh, in Jewish tradition, we have different steps, all of which are designed to help us relive the experience of being liberated from Egypt. The Hebrew is Bechol Dor Vador. In every generation, we are called to see ourselves as if we emerged ourselves from Egypt. Part of the way I do that is by having a plate with symbols on it called a Seder plate, and the different symbols each point to a different facet of the story. The charoset, which is a sweet mixture of sometimes apples, sometimes dates, and nuts, and grape juice or wine, is supposed to signify the mortar with which my ancestors built the pyramids in Egypt. It's a symbol of slavery. Among the symbols uh, on the Seder plate on the table 
are the maror, which is uh, a bitter herb. Sometimes it's a horseradish, sometimes it's romaine lettuce. It's meant to taste bitter to my mouth, just as slavery tasted bitter to our mouths. Other symbols, including salt water, are there. And I take something that is green, because Passover is also called Chag Ha'aviv, the holiday of the spring, where things begin to grow again. And I take something that is a symbol of life, and I dip it into salt water, not once, but twice. And I take it out, and I eat it. In so doing, I recognize that not everything is so fresh and sweet. Our history has moments that are salty and bitter, like tears. So too is life meant to continue. We're called by the Torah itself, by the Bible, to remember to be just with a stranger, to be kind to the stranger, to love the stranger 36 times in the Torah, because we know what it is to be a stranger. If I've truly relived my story, then not only will my heart be moved, but my body will be moved to remember that liberation is either collective or not at all. I cannot be free if my sisters and brothers are not. I cannot be liberated if anyone in the world is enslaved. I believe that Passover is there as a wake-up call to the Jewish community to be active, involved in your neighbor's welfare. Okay, thank you. So the different symbols and traditions of the Passover, as you've saw, seen just now, calls the people of God, Israelites, to remember not simply the salvation of God or the ticket to heaven. It is actually remembering what he mentioned, the, the leaven bits of himself, of ourselves. In the New Testament, we also learn that leaven, you know, this thing, is also a symbol for sin. So for us Christians, more than simply just puffed up bits or the pride parts, it's also all the sin in our lives, remembering what God has saved us from. What is very interesting about the rabbi's explanation about the various traditions is the concept that remembering for them is more than just thinking about something that is so far away, but it was a reenactment of an experience. It was a participation of an experience that they were remembering. So it's not simply remembering, but you realize the word he used, he said, relive, right? It's a way of relieving it. And so, and so the so what part, right? Um, the effect of these traditions was to help them grow empathy and love for the stranger because they were once strangers themselves. It is to also help them to look at what leaven still exists in their lives. So brothers and sisters, when we are called to remember God's salvation and goodness, it is more than a call to gratitude. It is a call to remember our own sinfulness, our own leavens. You know, it is a call to remember God's power in our lives over these sinfulness and to remember that we were once enslaved to sin ourselves and to look at others with love rather than pride. And so the emphasis on remembrance here should uh, or has the effect of not simply thanksgiving, but also repentance, forgiveness, and love. You know, I'm reminded of the story Jesus told about the guy who owed someone, a king, money in Matthew 18. You know, the story starts with Peter approaching Jesus about this issue of forgiveness. And Jesus tells this story of a man who was owing a king 10,000 talents, which in the NLT translates to millions of dollars. So he was about to sell everything, you know, his wife, children, everything he owned in order to repay this debt. But the king decided to forgive his debt out of pure grace. Later, the man went to a fellow servant who owed him an equivalent of possibly a few thousand dollars. You know, in the scripture, it says he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. And when that fellow servant couldn't, this guy basically threw his friend into jail. When the other servants saw what happened, in a nutshell, you can call it basically they are very pushwang, they were very unhappy and complained to the king. The king then said to this guy, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? You see, the unforgiving servant in the story had forgotten the mercy he had received. Brothers and sisters, when we remember our sin, how in desperate need of God we are, 
It produces a natural sense of humility and ability to give grace to others. And this should be the effect of remembering our sins before God. We not only cast out the existing leaven in our lives, we also learn to empathize and give grace to others. So in this new year, the emphasis on remembrance challenges us to think. Number one, is there any leaven in me that I'm reminded of today that needs to be removed, cut off in this new year? Am I unable to forgive or give grace to others who have offended me? Lastly, there is an emphasis on worship through obedience. Exodus 12 is a command. In fact, God had declared it a statute, meaning that basically it is a law. So it's not a nice to have, you know, but a law that the Lord's people will have to abide. And you may think right now, wow, a bit draconian. Uh. You know, most memorial days uh, or days of commemoration is just uh, encouragement, you know, to encourage remembrance and specific social behaviours that can be learned. So for example, our Racial Harmony Day, you know, is to commemorate the communal riots of 1964, you know, if you don't remember your social studies. You know, it is meant to re help us to remember and not forget the lessons from history, you know. Uh, and National Day is an annual event to remember how we had independence from Malaysia and to celebrate the precious sovereignty of the country. Yet none of these are law, you know. You won't get arrested if you went for a holiday uh, over the NDP weekend. But God has instituted that this Passover experience be a permanent festival and it's a statute for the people of God. They are to observe it. This means that there is more than remembrance at play here. There is also a big factor of obedience. A law, especially one from God, is designed to be obeyed. Obedience is hence another expression of a key value or behaviour that is highlighted through this entire New Year tradition. Obedience is demanded throughout the entire passage. The way to celebrate, what to eat, how to eat it, what to do before and during the festival season, you can read more yourself in uh, chapter 12, uh, what to say, what to do, certain things. You know, these are all instructions from God and they are meant to be obeyed. Verse 27 and uh, 8 says, And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, you know, as the Lord had commanded. So they did. Do you see a repeated emphasis on doing as the Lord commanded? So in other words, this entire tradition is not just a tradition, but it's actually a discourse. It's a way of relating to God. When the Israelites celebrate this festival, it is a direct act of obedience to God. Verse 26 says, And when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? The word service here, referring to the entire festival, comes from the same word used for worship. And I'm sure it has been mentioned in other sermons or Christian education class before that the word worship in Hebrew is the same root word as serving or working. So worship is ultimately a service rendered unto God. And as I reflected upon this statement, I realized that even though I know this, but more often than not, we have been so conditioned uh, or so instinctive for us to define worship as my fellowship time with God. And it's not wrong, because ultimately it is, you know, as with many things, a union with Christ. Yet the problem here is that when we only focus on that, we will focus on how fun or how enjoyable, or how good this fellowship time is. And if it was not very good, we tend to blame the music, the speaker, the aircon too cold, etc., etc. Or sometimes you would just wonder, you know, is God here at all? And we might say, no, I, I didn't really feel God during worship today. And so worship has to not be simply a feel-good session or gathering. Worship is first and foremost a service. It's a work rendered unto the Almighty God. It's a time of serving where the focus is on the Master and King of our lives. That is the focus of worship. And today's passage brings it one step further by showing that this worship, this service, actually in itself is an act of obedience unto God. So worship through obedience, serving the Lord by being faithful to what he has commanded us. 
That is an emphasis that we can glean through the way God has commanded them to celebrate their new year. And this is the way the Israelites were commanded to begin their Nisan month, okay, or their January, to obey God's command in a time of worship. That was how they started a new year, to obey God in a time of worship. Who's, and this worship, this creative director, worship director is actually God himself. And so, brothers and sisters, today as we enter into our new year, perhaps we can likewise enter it with a heart of worship. We can enter into it with a heart of submissiveness and obedience unto the Lord. That it is a time where we lay our egos down, ourselves down, in order to choose and obey God. And this is not going to be easy because we all know that obedience to God is often a call out of our comfort zones. Just as Abraham was called to simply go from his country into the unknown, in our walk of obedience to God, there will always be unknowns and things that are so uncomfortable for us, such as you know, loving people you don't like or doing something that gives you so much anxiety. But it is in our obedience that we render true worship to our amazing God. So in our final reflections today, what is your heart of worship like? Is it one that seeks to fulfill itself or one that seeks to obey God? How can you worship God through obedience this year? Are there things you need to do to step out of your comfort zone? So today as we celebrate Chinese New Year Eve together with our families and loved ones, I pray that our reflections from God's way of celebrating a new year inspire us to remember what is important to God. Our lives as a new creation in Him, our walk towards holiness and love, and our worship ultimately expressed in obedience. So let us be truly new in this new year. Let us pray. Father, indeed, you have called us to remember, even through the songs of worship just now, that you are a holy God, worthy to be feared and revered, and that before you, there is nothing we can gift that is truly befitting of your majesty. And so, Father, I pray that, Lord, as we have heard your, your, your word today, that, Lord, that we will be challenged to step out of ourselves. And in this time, if the Holy Spirit is surfacing in you anything that you might need to surrender to him, may you obey. And even as we all go forward for Chinese New Year, it could be a time where sometimes it's quite difficult for certain people to go through. Father, I pray that, Lord, that you would draw near to, to the people who are hurting through this New Year, that you would be their father for them. And that, Lord, that um, we can all respond to you in thanksgiving, rejoicing, and obedience. I commit my brothers and sisters here into your hands. We pray all these in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.